Welcome to today's session on philosophy of research in, in entrepreneurship. Uh, we covered a lot of ground in this session, so bear with me. I'm happy to answer questions at the end, but there's a lot of things we, we discuss in this session. So let's sort of take a, take a quick uh, stock of where we are in entrepreneurship research. Uh, as Shefford says in his 2015 uh, paper, uh, entrepreneurship research has made tremendous progress over time. There's no denying that. If you look at research in the 1970s, 80s, the quality of the research today, theoretically and empirically is much better than it was. There's also, Dave, as Davidson says in his book, 2016, entrepreneurship research is now truly global with scholars from around the world interested in entrepreneurship research and its relevance for economic prosperity and societal progress. The same sort of sentiment is echoed by policymakers in many, many countries uh, from Europe to Asia, to North America, to Latin America, that entrepreneurship is the ticket to economic prosperity and societal progress. Um, and that is why it's so important that it be not only researched, but it also be taught. Today, some of you, especially those who are young here, people in their twenties might think, oh, that's natural, right? I mean what else right entrepreneurship is important for economic prosperity that's so natural well it is only natural because we see so many people around us talking about it if you look back even 20 years that was not the conversation so the conversation around this has shifted entrepreneurship is perhaps you know one of the only fields in business except economics of course uh, marketing doesn't have it you know uh, uh, finance doesn't have this, which has its own sort of global award that's, you know, similar to not the same as the Nobel Prize for Entrepreneurship Studies. It's not the same, but it's similar. Uh, good prize money, good sort of visibility, good, uh, you know, uh, uh, recognition of contribution to, to entrepreneurship studies. Um, the amount of entrepreneurship research that is being completed continues to increase dramatically. And there is lots of heterogeneity in who is contributing to it. Think about it, about only 30 years back, uh, Holmquist and Sundan had written that entrepreneurship research was about men, by men, and for men. Uh, you know, just look at the composition of our group here, the virtual summer seminar in entrepreneurship research. Uh, we have a good mix of both men and women. Pick up any journal and you will see both men and women contributing to the study of entrepreneurship. So things have changed uh, quite a lot, even with, with something like that. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there is much demand for entrepreneurship education among students and policymakers. Uh, now, of course, it is debatable the extent to which the demand for education translates into sort of entrepreneurial activity on the ground. And I'm happy to have that conversation uh, with folks, uh, those who are interested. Uh, but, but this is sort of where the field is right now, right? And notice this is all the good stuff. So I figured I would start with the good stuff before we sort of get into the problems, right? Um, when people look at all this good stuff, many say, well, all these good things are happening. So the system is largely perfect, right? Uh, entrepreneurship journals are increasing. They are publishing more research. The rigor of the research has increased. The quality of the research has increased. Men and women are both contributing to it. People around the world are interested in entrepreneurship research. The system is wonderful. The system is perfect. The system is the best it can be. And if you look at system justification theory, sort of introduced by Jost and Banerjee in 1994, uh, and JOS 2019 sort of summarized it, you know, uh, did a review piece. Thank you, Skylar, for putting that idea in my mind uh, for this session. He did a review piece on system justification theory. Um, system justification theory tells us why, whatever the system, there are going to be certain groups of people who think the status quo is good and is the best it can be. It's not that they are, they are, they are miss. It's not that they are sort of uh, mistaken, uh, but it's just sort of what they believe. It's they truly believe in that, and I call these people naivists. 
uh, from the word naive. Uh, not you know they are not they are not bad people. They are not they are not misguided. It's what they truly believe. I just think that they 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 believe wrong. Then there are also people who believe the system is largely broken. So Dennis Turish, who is in a UK university, said, if you look at sort of management uh, research, superficial theorizing, bad writing, focus on relatively trivial topics is endemic. Or Oja, who's at the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore, the whole enterprise of publishing in top journals is rather flawed. I call these people nihilists. We just talked about all the progress that has been made. So how can it be that everything is, you know, the system is largely broken? That, 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 to my mind, that's just not possible. I think the truth is somewhere in between. The system is not as perfect as the naivists would have us believe. It is not as flawed or broken as the nihilists would have us believe. Like anything else, you know, whatever country you're in, and we have people here who are in the US, who are in Europe, uh, who are in Asia, China, India. We have people here from Latin America, Mexico, uh, uh, Chile, uh, wherever you are. The system has some shortcomings in every sphere, pick, pick business, pick sports, pick films. The system has some shortcomings and can be improved. That's sort of where I come from. And I call people who sort of subscribe to this point of view that the system has positives, it also has some shortcomings and those shortcomings need to be improved. I call them realists, which means in my view, they are the ones who live in sort of the real world. And I think when I read Davidson's book, I only shared one chapter with you. I encourage you to read the whole book. And if you don't have access to the whole book, you know, feel free to ask Swati or, uh, Swati or uh, Jasmine to share the book with you. Um, they, they make the same point. The system is not perfect and needs to be improved. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's how any field should be. So what is the system? So some of you who are experienced in research know this. For those of you who do not, let me sort of summarize the system really quickly. You and some co-authors will put together a research paper. Okay, that's the first step. I say you and some co-authors because I think the latest count is that about 90 to 95% papers in top journals are co-authored. The paper will then be submitted to conferences where it may or not get good feedback. Uh, I know some people skip this stage. I encourage you not to skip the stage. Definitely submit the paper to conferences, knowing that you may or may not get good feedback. Then you submit it to a journal where the editor in chief will review it for suitability for an entrepreneurship journal. Let's say JBV, ETP, and Shefford and Wickland sort of define how they assess suitability for an entrepreneurship journal. Does it contribute to ongoing conversations in entrepreneurship research? The paper then goes to an associate editor. For example, you met Brian Anderson last time. If you submit a paper to JBV, that's about methods he will get the paper. Today, you will meet Model Fu from Singapore, and he is also a field editor at JBV. If the paper is, say, in emotions in entrepreneurship or whatever his field of research is, then the paper will go to him, who will assign it to two or three reviewers. Um, submissions in entrepreneurship and management journals are free. So is the reviewing. Why is that important? That is not the case in all fields. In finance, for example, the submission fee can range from two, three hundred dollars to thousand dollars at top tier journals. In management and entrepreneurship, any journal that asks you for a fee is not a good journal to submit. In finance, good journals, you pay more money. So the fields are different and you cannot compare those two things. I also find that a lot of sort of new PhD students struggle with this idea. We had a PhD student here. He's no longer in the program, but he was. And he was saying, well, why shouldn't we get paid for reviewing? What he didn't understand is to, for him to be paid for reviewing, the authors have to be asked to pay a fee to submit. And so of course, he is not an author yet. He's only, he was only reviewing. So he was complaining about why he doesn't get paid. But I wonder how many authors 
among you are going to be excited at paying $300 to $1,000 for journal submission. Not many of us, right? So, so keep that in mind as you sort of think about how the field needs to be improved. Reviewers provide their critique of the paper, which the associate editor then uses to make a recommendation, either reject or, you know, uh, or review, uh, revise and resubmit. I'm sorry, revise and resubmit. Um, reviewers provide feedback and Shefford in his 2016 book that I believe Jasmine already shared with you, uh, Shefford sort of provides a description of this process in, in two sentences. This process of R&R, &R, revise and resubmit, continues until the paper is accepted or rejected. As Brian Anderson shared with you last time, only 5% of submitted papers are eventually accepted at a journal like JBB. And again, in, in his 2016 book, Shefford write, writes, as an author, I always feel happy with an R&R, &R, regardless of whether it is high risk. Friends have told me that not all people feel the same way. To be honest, I've learned from my experience that all people do not feel the same way. I was recently working with a PhD student or a former PhD student who's now a junior professor. I will not name where. The paper got an R&R &R, and his decision was to withdraw the paper so he can submit it to a journal where he doesn't have to go through an R&R. &R. And you know, my thinking is that's the wrong, the wrong approach. Uh, you want the R&R &R so that the paper improves, so that you work on it and you improve the paper based on the reviewer's comments. You do not want to submit papers to journals that accept it without asking you for changes, because that means the quality of the journal and the review process is not good. In this system, the system sort of works on some assumptions, and the assumptions are that the results reported in the paper are accurate and robust. There are no mistakes and no fraud in the author's preparation of the manuscript, okay? The review process is generally not designed to look for fraud or mistakes, at least gross mistakes. The review process sort of assumes that the authors are being honest in their reporting of, of the results. The review process also assumes that it is double blind peer reviewed. What does that mean? The reviewers do not know who the authors are and the authors do not know who the reviewers are. Another assumption is that the reviewers assess the paper solely on its merits without any prejudice of any kind, prejudice towards results, prejudice towards the topic, prejudice towards uh, any other aspect of the manuscript. This whole system also assumes that the editor makes the decision solely on the merits of the paper. The author's identity, remember I said double blind peer review. The reviewers do not know who the authors is. The authors do not know who the reviewers are, but the editor knows who the author is. So the assumption is that the editor makes the decision solely on the merits of the paper without regard to the author's identity or their university. And that during this review process, everyone behaves honestly and conscientiously. That's sort of the assumptions that go behind, that underlie the system that I described in the previous slide. And when these assumptions are met, scientific prog science progresses in a constructive fashion. That's how science works. That's the ideal scenario. Of course, remember I said I'm a realist, which means the system is not perfect which means that like all assumptions, these two are not always met. Is the review process truly blind? These days, you can Google the title of a paper, for example, and see if that paper has been in conferences. And if it has been, you will be able to find out who's presented it. So is the review process truly blind if you're a reviewer? That's one example. Violations can be on the part of authors, reviewers, or editors. Um, on the part of authors, there can be mistakes, errors, or fraud, example, p-hacking. Uh, there are many prominent examples of authors who committed fraud and pretty much ruined their career. You're welcome to Google about them. Diedrich Stapel, Frederick Wallumber, and Brian Wonsnick. The first two were business, were publishing in business journals. The last one was not, but you can sort of, you know, Google about them and learn. 
learn about them. And they were celebrities before sort of their fraud got caught. And, um, and uh, you know, this whole thing came to the surface. Um, there is also a discussion in the entrepreneurship literature on the debate between business planning and firm performance research. And we'll talk about this in the, in the, in the next slide on how that sort of relates to this issue of author mistakes. There can also be violations on the part of reviewers. Reviewers can be rude. Reviewers can be unrealistic. They're, the reviewers can be careless. I remember when I was in the PhD program, one of my professors said to me, you spend months and months writing a paper, months and months collecting the data, months and months analyzing it. And then of course, months and months getting friendly feedback and submitting the paper. A reviewer may spend anywhere from 30 minutes to four hours on your paper and decide the fate of your paper. And I thought, wow, that's, that's careless. If I'm spending months and months, shouldn't the reviewer spend days and days thinking about my paper? And then of course, when I became a reviewer, I learned how difficult it is to, you know, put the time to review papers. All the reviewers can be plain unethical. Uh, Academy of Management has a code of conduct for reviewers, an ethical code. But as Feldman noted in his 2005 papers, reviewers, some reviewers may act sadistically towards both the authors and the editors. And that's, that's just reality. That's how it happens. Violations can also be on the part of editors. Uh, David Rapp wrote that it is the eth ethical responsibility of editors to assign the viewers that represent expertise and balanced perspectives, never attempting to pre-influence ratings either against or in favor of a particular manuscript or set of authors. Again, that's how ideally, ideally the system is supposed to work. And yet, sometimes the editors may be in violations of these assumptions. Editors may assign paper to easy reviewers or difficult reviewers knowingly. Editors may accept their own paper. Barney 2006 in the book chapter he wrote, explains how he, his 19, famous 1991 paper was getting accepted, getting rejected at every good journal until he reject, he accepted it at a journal where he was the associate editor. So, I mean, I, I appreciate his candor in sort of accepting, uh, you know, how the paper came to be published but it does tell you now that I think has changed over time. Most good journals have made it more difficult to do that sort of thing. Or editors may be more inclined towards papers on certain topics or papers by certain authors. That, that happens too. So the violations can be on the part of authors, reviewers, and editors. Three problems I tell PhD students are sort of major in the way the system is set up. The first problem is the reviewers, editors, and readers of journal articles are biased to the new and the novel. Uh, in the US at least, I don't know how it's in India, Asia, Europe, Latin America, but in the US at least, all PhD students in business programs, uh, well, in management business, management PhD programs, at some point read the paper, that's interesting, by Davis 1991, okay? So if you've not read this paper, make sure you read that paper. And that paper pretty much says it's, what's interesting about your paper is the new and the novel, right? I mean, that's where many of us believe sort of that bias comes from. Um, Davidson, the problem with this sort of bias towards new and novel is, if every paper is about novelty, then where are the efforts to replicate or reproduce past claims? And as Davidson describes in the book chapter you read, a state replication is difficult to get published in a highly ranked journal. Um, remember I was talking about the Delmar and Shane paper. So in, in a recent, in a 2014 paper in Journal of Business Venturing Insights, uh, Honig and Samuelson uh, tried to replicate Delmar and Shen's paper, and they said our intention was to replicate it, and we found that it is not possible to replicate that paper. So, you know, th there's that problem sort of, you know, in our in our research. Most good journals 
JBV, ETNP in entrepreneurship or SMJ, AMJ in management in general, only will publish papers with significant coefficients, okay? Which means, and this is not just a problem in entrepreneurship or management in general, it's across all social sciences, uh, finance, marketing, same thing. The problem with that is that what about papers that don't show insignificant findings? For example, I do work in gender. If only papers that show significant gender differences will be published, then what about places where there are no gender differences? If you read the literature, you will feel that, of course, it is proven that there are gender differences in many aspects of entrepreneurship. But what you don't often realize is that papers showing no gender differences were never published. And so the field seems sort of biased towards this idea of significant coefficients, which means, which tilts sort of how the field, uh, the, the knowledge base in the field. What happens if the results claimed in one setting are not, you know, do not generalize in another setting? That's sort of a common issue. For example, results from an experimental study may not generalize to the field, but just testing some idea in the field is not new and novel. So, you know, so then that makes it difficult to publish. Or results from a study in the US, which comprises the majority of the papers in entrepreneurship research in good journals, may not generalize to other countries or vice versa. So entrepreneurial orientation and firm performance. If that's what you're studying, people will say, well, this has been studied, you know, 20,000 times. Why do you need another study? But what if the results from the US or Sweden or China the top three countries in this literature, let's say do not generalize to Chile or Mexico or you know, another country with different sort of socio-cultural context. And research in management, entrepreneurship, social sciences in general is based on a narrow slice of humans. Heinrich Hein and Noren Zion got lots of sort of press for coining the term weird, Western educated, industrialized, rich, and developed contexts. Uh, one could argue, so, you know, th there's that issue. Welter Baker in their 2016 paper brought up this issue saying, you know, all of us are studying the same types of entrepreneurs, high growth, high technology, right? Usually in, in, in North America, uh, usually not always. So educated, industrialized, rich, developed, sort of that kind of entrepreneurship. What about the everyday entrepreneurship that's happening around the world? Uh, and, and, you know, that, that sort of is not getting the attention in, in our journals. Every time we finish sort of this session, my overview with where do you go from here? What does this mean for aspiring entrepreneurship researchers? My advice to you is, First, understand that scientists have known for centuries, and I'm not saying this, Hunter, Schmidt, and Jackson said this in their 1982 paper. We've known for centuries that a single study is not the answer. You watched John Oliver's video about scientific studies. You heard my discussion about new and novel versus applications. It's not a single study that tells you much. Think about cumulative evidence from many studies. Now, what do you know about X? As authors, as reviewers, many of you may also be editors in a few years, uphold the highest standards in whatever you do. As you know, some of you are starting your PhD program, some of you are already in the PhD program, no matter what stage of the program you are in, talk to your professors and volunteer to review for conflicts in the conferences and journals. As a PhD student or as a, you know, as an as a newbie, you know, it's not like SMJ or AMJ or even JBV will ask you to review for them. So talk to your professor and say, what's a journal that will accept me to review? How can I contribute to make, you know, giving constructive review that the authors can use to advance their research in a meaningful fashion? I know I said replications are difficult to publish. I know that. And still I encourage you to undertake replications of published papers to submit to conferences and journals. Uh, we've, uh, we've, some of us 
have started sort of a informal replication network where we undertake replications and we we've tried to publish them and we've had some success and we are happy to encourage sort of other people to publish and we are considering sort of making this more institutionalized but i am a big 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 supporter of good replication studies so i also say if someone wants to replicate your paper support them fully our goal is to advance knowledge for scientific progress not to publish papers for the sake of publishing them serve as track chairs accept to be on editorial boards if you're invited uh, you know find your place to sort of contribute to this system uh, publishing is not a game that we master or manipulate i'm amazed at how many phd students sort of finish the program thinking this is some sort of game it is not we are here to advance knowledge and contribute to scientific progress and publishing is sort of the way to do that but is not the end is a means to the end there are many good things in our profession with many good highly intelligent people doing very good research my wife and i are both professors my sister is a phd and a professor and you know when i talk to them i say it is amazing how many highly intelligent people are in our profession like you go to academy of management or babson and you listen to some of these presentations and you go wow how does someone think like that how does someone come up with that kind of data how does someone come up with that kind of research that's amazing and you feel and there's some research in psychology on the imposter phenomenon you feel like an imposter when you're in these sessions you feel like you do not belong i feel like that still after 20 years in this profession yet things can be improved and should be improved there are many many good things and yet we can do better and we should be trying to do better be the change you want to see in the profession okay i know it you know it's sort of cliche to say say be the change you want to see but i truly truly think that's what research that's what we as academics should be be the change you want to see if you are to find faults in the system do it but only if you're willing to be part of the solution if you do not want to be part of the solution don't waste your time and other people's time finding faults with the system as davidson says in his 2016 chapter that you read our goal is to develop more solid knowledge about entrepreneurship and as i said a minute back publications are the step towards that goal not the goal in itself uh, i'll stop here we have past time we may not have time for questions i'm going to see if our guest speaker is here today if he is uh, then we'll take the questions for my session after we listen to him if yeah. he's not hi Kishai, I'm, I'm here yeah hey model how are you i i'm good i'm good how are you good i hope you didn't have to wait too long oh no no it was i was here for the last five minutes and it was actually interesting to hear your your, your summary okay i i hope i didn't say anything that you disagree no actually with. i resonated with a lot of things i actually i actually took took notes <laughs> thank you moder so moder here's how we do this i'll introduce you and then we will go from there is that good uh, that's good mm -hmm. okay so moder welcome to the virtual summer seminar in entrepreneurship research uh, and for our audience dr moder fu is a professor at the national university of singapore he has a phd from mit a bachelor's degree from national university of singapore He's a field editor at the Journal of Business Venturing and Entrepreneurship Theory and Practice. Uh, he's on the editorial review board of many journals, uh, AMJ, AMP, SEJ, and several others. I could go through and through, you know, the list of journals where he has been a guest editor or served as editor. But you know that uh, suffice it to say that he served the field at the highest levels in terms of the journals. My understanding is. he also has honorary professorships at two different universities nankai and jilin and outside of academia uh, or he 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 worked with the singapore armed forces and the reserves he's worked for the ministry of foreign affairs of singapore before he came into academia and was also <laughs> an officer with singapore police force in his younger days and he he in his email to me he mentioned that he was 
uh, not the kind of police officer you often <laughs> see in in the movies or on TV. He was a good police officer. So <laughs> with that, uh, Moder, welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Visha. Thanks so much for uh, inviting me. Um, just just and it, just a small correction. I'm, I'm now uh, moved to the Nanyang Technological uh, University. Um, okay. It's also good, you know, I, I notice a few familiar faces, uh, Alka, Goshan, and I think I'm going to see David Rapp uh, next week, you know, where I think you're one of the participants of the uh, Entrepreneurship Meet Career Consortium, of which uh, I'm co-organizing uh, this year. Perfect. That tells people how small this, this profession is, right? Um, so before I ask Modern my first question, let me also make a personal observation, personal note here. Model may not remember it, but the first paper I ever published, which was in ETNP, Model gave us friendly review on the paper. And back then I didn't even know him. And he was still willing to take the time to give us friendly review. Uh, and of course that paper was later published in ETNP. And although I didn't realize it at that time, I can say looking back that to be at the level where he's at, and still be willing to give friendly review on a paper from a PhD student who he doesn't even know. I mean, that says something about, uh, about the guy. So thank you, Moda. I know I never thanked you for it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, so my first question to you, Moda, is how did you get to entrepreneurship research? How did you decide to do a PhD? Uh, so sort of your life journey to academia. <laughs> Well, I, I really sort of chance upon academia. Um, you know, I was sort of first generation to attend college. So, you know, didn't even know much about what, uh, you know, university life is, uh, let alone what a professor life uh, is going to be. <clears throat> and, you know, as, as uh, Visha mentioned, I worked in several places. And, and one day I happened to talk to a friend who, uh, was a graduate teaching assistant and she, she described her, her, uh, her work and, you know, I was like, wow, you know, you're paid to kind of explore ideas uh, and you just basically do whatever you're interested in. And I said, you know, I was working uh, in the civil service. I said, you know, that's the kind of job I want. <laughs> so I didn't know what academia was. Uh, and 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 and, and uh, so I went to uh, my PhD because you know you, you need a PhD to become a professor. And then I finished up my uh, comprehensive examinations. You know, some places call it the qualifying examinations. And I was really really interested in uh, OB or organizational behavior issues. So after I finished my uh, qualifying examination, uh, Scott Shane then was a new professor at MIT. So I, I spoke with Scott and Scott said, you know what, um, there wasn't at that point in time, there wasn't much work on um, teams in entrepreneurship. So I said, all right, that's, that's my digital station, right? I knew I wanted to do teams. I, I knew I was interested in the behavioral perspective. I had no idea what entrepreneurship was. I took a grand total of zero entrepreneurship classes uh, when, you know, at the point when I finished my qualifying examination. And so I did a, a PhD on teams, but I, I still saw myself primarily as an OB person studying teams. And then as I, you know, after I graduated, uh, this idea of um, sort of cognition uh, was very important. And so I, I, I said, hey, but you know, the, the, a lot of the cognition perspective was really um, at the individual level. So I said, you know, I could bring in some of the team perspectives. So I stayed on. And, and brought in a team perspective in, in uh, cognition. And then teams research itself became quite important. Uh, and, and so I stayed on and also did teams work. And, and then, you know, what I always thought was interesting was that people talk a lot about emotions being important in entrepreneurship in, in the popular literature. But at that point in time, there wasn't much work. So I stayed on and, and said, let me do a bit work on emotions and, and entrepreneurship. And after that, kind of brought more recently, broaden it to to well-being. So I guess the 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 moral story is I, I it's not why I went to entrepreneurship. If it's why I never left entrepreneurship. <laughs> so I never went into entrepreneurship. I just never left. And I I think the the key take home point here is uh, entrepreneurship is a very 
a welcoming umbrella. So whether you are from sociology, philosophy, even you know um, economics, uh, even uh, economic geography, you know, there are always interesting questions in entrepreneurship that you can answer and you can look at even if you don't primarily see yourself as an entrepreneurship scholar. Um, and in fact, in actual fact, um, up to 10 years ago, uh, when people asked me, what are you? I said, you know, I'm, I'm a OB scholar that happens to study entrepreneurship. Uh, but no one believes me anymore, right? So I just say yeah, I'm an entrepreneurship scholar. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's, that was my entrepreneurship journey, which I, 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 I went on by chance, just never left the journey. And, and more than there are few people in our group here too who are interested in teams. So don't be surprised if you get an email from one of them after this session uh, reaching out to you uh, that there are PhD students here interested in teams and entrepreneurship. But my next question to you is, tell us about one entrepreneurship paper of your choice that you've published and sort of the journey from idea to publication. So I, I, I picked the paper uh, which I co-published with uh, Rebecca Funken and Michael Glenick. And uh, the title of the paper is, uh, how can problems be turned into something good? The role of entrepreneurial learning and error mastery orientation. Uh, this paper was published in ETP last year. And, and the reason why I chose this paper was because uh, this paper was published um, using the dissertation of Rebecca Funken. So let me, so, so in that sense, you know, um, how did the paper come about? Well, the, the paper come about was, so Rebecca was doing her dissertation and um, Michael Glenick, uh, and, and those of you who knows the work of Michael Glenick and Michael Frazee, uh, you know that they do a lot of uh, sort of training slash consulting slash, slash research in, in Africa. So, so Rebecca um, tagged along and help uh, Michael and, and Michael, no, Michael Frazee and Michael Glenick uh, to do this research. So that's, and, and because she was doing this research, uh, that became part of her, her dissertation. And one of the interesting things that Rebecca was kind of looking at was uh, problems, right? That, you know, um, entrepreneurs face a lot of problems along the way. And then, um, and, and then she, she really kind of found that, um, you know, problems sometimes will, will lead to uh, better venture outcomes, sometimes worse venture outcomes. So, so I guess there was kind of a, a, a practical significance of, of that paper. But again, you know, to, to publish a paper, you, you needed a sort of a theoretical perspective. But Rebecca was saying, well, you know, and, and, and even Michael Glenick was saying, yeah, it was an interesting paper. It was, you know, practically important to understand this question, um, but there wasn't a, uh, there wasn't a puzzle. Um, so, you know, we, we just use this for Rebecca dissertation um, and, and then, you know, that will be the end of the paper, right? Um, but then this way I, you know, I, I came in, I said, well, I think, I think there is a puzzle there, right? And, and the puzzle was, um, you know, entrepreneurs face a lot of problems, but problems by definition isn't a good thing, right? And we hear about startups being sort of a resource constraint, uh, issues of legitimacy. So how, how can problems be a good thing? Uh, but yet at, at the same time, we know a lot of the work on lean startup and they're talking about how you are supposed to um, face problems and then you learn from there and then you improve along the way and that will help your venture. So, so to me, there was a puzzle, right? There was kind of two um, very different perspectives about what problem was. One is by definition, a problem is a bad thing, right? I mean, no one wants to have problems with your paper, no one has problems in going through your PhD program, you know, we just don't want problems, right? The other hand, uh, the lean startup says that problem is a good thing. Um, so that's how we wrote the paper. I think, I think it was rejected by, um, uh, JBV, that was in the first instance. And, and because we, we drew primarily on the failure li literature, uh, and, and the reviewers say, you know, problems are important, yes, but they, you know, but that's not failure, right? Failure is, is really a very extreme case. So, so as we saw the feedback, uh, we revised the paper and we, we drew more from 
issues of setbacks, so, so things like disasters and, and other uh, situations whereby entrepreneurs face setbacks, but the setbacks is not final like a failure. Um, so, so, so that that sort of, you know, the paper sort of went uh, relatively well. So I think the, the, the key point that we I wanted to kind of bring out is um, as you think through your dissertation, you know, think through um, what, what, what's the key puzzle that you, you want to answer out of it? Um, and then, um, you know, work, work with your professors and, and I think, you know, together uh, a good piece of work uh, can, can come out of it. Uh, so so that's, that was, so the, the ETP, you know, uh, review fortunately was kind of relatively smooth, the, you know, but of course it was rejected by JVD and, and maybe some other places I, I cannot uh, remember. So, so more than what I heard you say was how the theoretical anchoring of this paper was sort of an iterative process to find. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You thought this was a theoretical anchoring and then, you know, based on the reviewer's feedback, you decided that was not the proper theoretical anchoring and that you needed to change it. Is that an accurate description? Yes, uh, that was an accurate uh, description. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, and so I think this Go ahead. Yeah. So initially, we were anchoring around, you know, some of um, Dean Shepard's work. You know, so Dean Shepard, Don Detain, you know, they, they all did some work on on sort of failure, right? So we, we anchored a, a, along this literature, um, but then we kind of shifted a little bit and then uh, anchored on some of well, again Dean Shepard. So Dean Shepard and uh, I think it's Thompson or, or, or someone else. Um, they do a lot of work on disasters, uh, which is sort of. Uh, significant events, uh, setbacks that entrepreneurs face, uh, yet, you know, they, they, they managed to, to solve it. So we changed the anchoring a, a little bit. Although the big picture that I mentioned at the start, you know, that, that didn't change as much. Yeah, recently one of our participants was asking me, how do you decide the theoretical anchoring? So I think the, what you des described is very, very useful in, in that regard. Now let me switch gears a little bit. Um, as a reviewer and editor, and you've served in both roles, what do you look for in a paper? How do you decide if a paper has potential or not? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I was thinking about it and say, what are the three main problems that I, I see in, in many papers? Um, I think the first is that, and, and the good thing is, I think it was very consistent with, I think, uh, the, the previous few speakers, I, you know, I, I actually listened to like four, four to five speakers uh, to prepare for today's session and learn a lot from uh, the sessions. And I think what was consistent among all the speakers was that you first have to paint the situation, right? Um, I remember one of your speakers called it the A, B, C, D, right? I forgot what the A is, but, but uh, I used the, the, the primitive principle and I called it the situation. Um, and the situation is important, as one of the previous speaker mentioned, and I totally agree, is because it lays out which conversation you are uh, tackling. So very often, um, because entrepreneurship is, is sort of a phenomenon, right? But within that phenomena, there are groups of conversations. So the situation tells essentially the, the reader, the reviewer, and the editor which conversation um, that, that you are going into. Uh, and then from there, uh, you know, wh what is the complication? What's the issue around that uh, situation that is um, insufficient, right? And of course, it has to be insufficient and it has to be important, right? I also recall one of your speakers mentioned that it cannot be a gap because gap itself doesn't matter. There are gaps everywhere, right? And a lot of things have not been studied, right? It, it, so it is it's a, um, it, it's, it's a gap, yes, but it's an important gap and how you resolve the gap. And I, I recall one of the speaker mentioned also, and then the last part is how then your research helps to orient future research in that area. So that's, that's one thing that I see missing in a lot of paper. Um, they, they assume that we know the situation. Uh, they assume we know why the gap is important. Um, they assume that once they got the results, we will know what it means for uh, future research in that stream. So that's, that's not so uh, obvious. So that, that I think is uh, point one, uh, which I think a lot of speakers mentioned. Um, point two is spend time collecting good data. Uh, you know, the number of times 
papers get rejected because the paper, the data is bad, you know, one-time data collection, um, measures don't, uh, you know, don't, the proxies do not fit with the, the conceptual things. And I, I advise students that, you know, if you're going to spend three months doing nothing or even six months doing nothing but doing good data collection, that is uh, time well spent because you're going to spend years writing the paper. Right? So six months, three months is, is, is time well spent. Uh, collect good data. Um, and then the, the third issue I will see, we see is a poor theory versus data fit. Because sometimes, you know, especially I see that among sort of the more junior researchers, that they come up with a very interesting question and they say, I want to answer it, but well, you know, it may be an interesting question, but if your data is not there, then you have to only, you can only answer the question that your data has, right? I remember Laura Huang, I, I recall listening to a talk and she talked about uh, data and um, uh, theory and data fit. And that, you know, I recall she said she will, she will reject the paper if there's no theory data fit. And I see that um, very frequently. So those are the three things that, that you look for mm -hmm. in, in the paper. Um, before we turn to the audience questions, I have one more question for you. And that is, can you tell us about one entrepreneurship paper that you're working on these days mm -hmm. and sort of where do you see it? You know, how do you intend to take it forward? Yeah, so I chose a paper that, that I'm, I'm also working with a PhD student. Um, and this paper started with, so I, I, I taught a PhD class, uh, uh, well, actually just a few months ago and, and last year, I should, you know, done something like Visha is doing, right? You know, I had like six students, right? You know, Visha has like over a hundred students. So, uh, so we did that, we did that last year. And um, so that was in January last year. And, and of, of course, the, the hot topic at that time, Jan you know, January last year, you know, which unfortunately is still today, COVID. So I told the students, I said, let's, let's, let's try something fun, right? Let's do machine language, which I knew nothing about, but everyone's talking about it. Let's do machine language and let's um, do something relating to um, COVID. Uh, and, and since, you know, COVID, there's a lot of emotional ups and downs, and it's also my research area, the student decided that, and, and it was also her area. And, and she said, okay, let's, let's, let's see how emotions and, and COVID uh, uh, can be linked uh, using machine language. Uh, but as, as we worked through the paper, uh, we, we decided that the, 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 the machine language was still interesting, the emotions were still interesting, uh, the COVID wasn't so interesting, so, so we, we dropped that. Uh, so basically, um, what that paper was looking at, at you know, is how different kinds of uh, emotions activation influence the amount of um, crop, crop funding. Um, so I think, I think um, uh, to me, there, there are a few learning lessons from here. One is um, always try, you know, if you have a term paper in your entrepreneurship class, you know, try to use that as an opportunity to explore an idea for a, a real paper. Uh, so so even, even though the, the idea would change a lot, uh, even though the data might change a lot, um, PhD classes, term papers are always a fantastic time to... to um, try ideas. If anything, because your professor have no choice but to give you feedback. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so that's what we are still working on. And um, we, we, um, we worked over it for like, yeah, really a, a, a year because we, we, we still trying to pub, uh, publish it. Um, we haven't submitted it, uh, but we, we were thinking, you know, uh, trying for the best journals and, and, and keeping our fingers crossed, yeah. And Mordor, I really like your advice. I tell PhD students here that every term paper, they should try to at least take it to a conference mm -hmm. and some sort of journal submission. Agreed, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a good mindset for, for PhD yes. students to have. Given how difficult it has become to publish papers, uh, that's a missed opportunity if, if they don't do that. So thank yes. you and, and the time it takes is, is, is very long. And um, you know the, the idea only improves with with more feedback. Yeah. Yep. Now we have questions from the audience, so I'll ask with uh, Mike. Do you want to ask your first question? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Gupta, and uh, thank you, Dr. Fu, as well. Uh, so glad that you're here. And I had an opportunity some years ago to be in Singapore with my wife, and oh. it's just a wonderful place. 
I just really enjoyed it so much. Uh, so my question is, is regarding uh, your work that you did recently about a special issue on emerging economies, mm -hmm. too, about entrepreneurship and about how often we're studying uh, U.S.-based or, or Western European-based uh, entrepreneurship, and yet your article is talking about resource mobilization that happens in emerging uh, markets. And I'm really curious more to find out more about that. Well, yeah, so that's, that's a special issue together with, uh, uh, I think, Visha and uh, this, oh, I forgot, Brian. I uh, yeah, so, so, so Visha from India and Brian from Michigan. Yeah, so, so I think, you know, one of the things that I think, I really think that the emerging regions is where a lot of the exciting research is, is coming. Um, um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I think. And, and I also think that, um, so, so, so I'm, do, I'm doing an R&R &R now, right? And, and, and one of the review, and, and one of, so I wouldn't say which Middle Eastern country, in case, you know, maybe a reviewer is out here. But, but the reviewer said, oh, you know, um, what's the generalizability issue because you're studying a Middle Eastern country? And, and my mind was like, you know, if I study Stanford uh, or California <laughs> or Boston or, or Chicago, no one asked me about, you know, generalizability, although those are kind of very unique economies. So, so, um, so I think my pick on point today is when I re respond to those kind of comments now, I, I respond it as, um, you know, as a positive because it gives you the theoretical sort of boundaries about what the, the theory is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so sorry, Mike, I'm not sure whether I answered your, your, your question, but I, you know, I really think that a, a lot of the research, you know, in emerging regions are exciting and, and the fact that, you know, they are from different regions is a plus and not a generalizability issue. In fact, it gives you the theoretical boundaries, it pushes the theoretical boundaries. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. And, and more than having, having done some research in, in uh, outside the U.S. myself, I echo your point, which is a lot of times the viewers and editors will say, what's the generalizability of this study, this data that you collected in, I'm just going to say, let's say India. And I'm like, when I published that North America paper, you, nobody asked me that question. Yes. And I think some of it is reflective of the fact that 95% or 90% of editors and reviewers are located in, in North America. And one of the things I was hoping with, you know, with an audience like this is that people from among this audience will take up reviewer and editorial roles at our journals mm -hmm. so that that question becomes moot uh, about, you know, what's the generalizability? Yes. Yeah. But, so, but also, I think in responding today, I, I would kind of very gently point out that it's, uh, it's, it's actually uh, a positive thing and you know so when, when I started replying this kind of things 20 years ago I tended to be very apologetic like yeah I'm sorry it's not the typical North American sample but today I'm, I'm a little bit more politely pointing out that that is a positive aspect yeah uh, so we have more questions so Sadek do you want to go next thank you Dr. Gupta uh, thank you Dr. Fu um, I am kind of I have been in Singapore to join Telenor Singapore, almost there, but I have started my PhD, <laughs> taking a U-turn. <laughs> and so your talk is very interesting. And you spoke about Do Dr. Freeze. And so they do a lot of uh, entrepreneurship training, right? So I have a specific interest on that. And I was... Uh, I was interested to know that how do you think it's uh, uh, is it a good project to undertake for a PhD student where because training takes a long time right probably like six months and then longitudinal data and then I might end up in not publishing or just submitting to a journal when I am end of my PhD journey I am going to start my second year so uh, what's your opinion about that? Like, should should we be ambitious enough to undertake that kind of project or we should look into database? Like, I am personally uh, very passionate about experimental designs and more into the trainings. So mm -hmm. I wanted to know your thoughts about that. Yeah, so, so actually, um, uh, 
if you're going to, so a lot of the training, like for example, Michael Frazee uh, does, right? And a lot of my work on um, uh, experience sampling methodology. So, so, so it's really about three months um, and it can be as short as two weeks. Um, so, so I would say definitely go for that um, because, I mean, if you're a PhD student, uh, then, then I don't suggest six months, right? But if you look at a typical incubation, incubator training programs, it's also about 12 weeks, right? Uh, and some of them are as short as uh, eight weeks. Uh, if I push it, maybe six weeks. But I'll say eight weeks is reasonable. So, so I would say um, you should go for it, uh, eight-week training uh, program, a sort of an eight-week kind of design. Um, and, and if those eight weeks... It, you know, all you do is data collection is, is well worth it. Mm -hmm. and, and then you have very good data because, because you, can, you can change your, you know, if you have eight weeks worth of data, right? There's so many type of analysis that you can do. I guarantee you will find something interesting, right? So, so you know, I, I can guarantee you. you know, if you, if you have a well, good design, you'll find something in an eight week data collection. And, and then you can change your analysis, you can change your theorizing, but you have a nice set of data. So I always see a paper as like polishing a piece of diamond, uh, whereby, you know, uh, of course, polishing is very important, but at the end, inside, it has to be a real diamond, right? Uh, so, so, so two months, up to three months, even four months, uh, no issue. That, that, that will not hold back your dissertation and you will have a nice diamond to polish. Thank you so much. So, uh, Moda, both have the questions so far have come from men. So I think it's good that we give, uh, give the next question to a woman. So, Himanidhi, do you want to ask your question? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much, Professor, for the opportunity. Uh, actually, I, I'm also working on entrepreneurial teams, and I have read your papers on uh, new venture teams in the past. I mean, when I was doing my uh, literature review. So what I have seen in your papers, it's uh, the data collection. I was talking about to Professor uh, Gupta also a few days back. The data collection is one of the challenges that I'm facing in my study. When I look into your papers, you have 51 teams data. And uh, I just want to know uh, from you, is there any kind of reviews when you submitted your papers? Is it, is, was there any kind of reviews which talked about that you have, that you are doing empirical study and you have 51 teams data and how you're going to justify your data, your, you know, uh, the results, how you're going, going to justify that? Um, I just want to know about this. And the second question, if I'm allowed to ask you, <laughs> just, just taking uh, this opportunity to ask you this question. Second question that I'm going to ask you because right now you were talking about the that how you came up with this with the studies that you are that you did in the uh, in the beginning that there was some kind of theoretical some uh, Rebecca's uh, thesis work was there. Uh, how I came up with my uh, study right now that I'm doing currently that I'm doing is 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 based on the thesis also that I came up with the thesis the idea came from the thesis. And there is not a big work that has been done in that particular field. So how I'm going to justify that, how I should justify that, uh, you know, uh, in, when I'm present, I'm publishing my paper that from where I got this gap, is it, is it important to uh, write about it or just uh, coming up with some kind of, you know, uh, literature gaps or like that? Yeah. Okay. So I think that the second, uh, I'll take the second question first, because uh, if, I, if, I, if I paraphrase correctly, the issue is there is uh, no work, not much work related to your, Dissertation is that is that yes. accurate? Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, so every research paper needs to go into a conversation. So you need to know what the converse, the closest conversation, because so somebody must be interested in the conversation. So when I first started doing um, research on uh, emotions, um, there wasn't a lot of people doing uh, emotions work, right? I mean, there was a spattering. So I never, I do not start my paper with the emotion audience because it's, it's unlikely, because there, there wasn't, there was a smattering, but there wasn't a lot. So I always started with um, how cognition influences decision-making 
but emotions influences decision making. And so if you're interested in cognition, you cannot ignore emotions. Okay. So, 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 um, so if you have a new area, you need to think about because your reviewers are going to be, you know, people in the quote unquote old areas, right? You can't run away from that. So you have to think about which people in the old area would be interested in your work and how does your work uh, inform them? Okay, so you need to do that, right? So today when I when I write an emotions paper, I say emotions is important in entrepreneurship and then, you know, I, I, I don't talk about cognition and, uh, anymore, right? So so, so I, I guess the, the short answer is, um, you, yes, you still have to go to a conversation, see who is your likely conversation and how do you um, extend their understanding. I, I hope that helps. Uh, the second question, I, I, the first question, I didn't get too much. If I paraphrase, uh, are you asking how do you justify just having 51 teams? Is that your question? Yes, uh, because you did empirical research in that. Yes. And doing it with uh, less data, I mean, it, was there any kind of review from your from the reviewers that this is a less data that you're working on and you're doing empirical research? How do you yeah. justify that? Yeah. Um, so I think the, the, the good thing about team research is that, you know, reviews tend to be a little bit more understanding. You know, they, you, we know we can't get like 300 data points, right? But, but having said that, I, I do advise students. So I do advise students, even when they do team research to grow closer to uh, 100 even today. And what I typically advise them if they're doing it for their dissertation, I say, well, for a dissertation, 50 plus seems reasonable. But, you know, even as you're working on a dissertation, you, you know, continue to collect the data. And some of the data can be collected even after you finish your dissertation. Um, so so, so my, my suggestion would be, um, you know, for a dissertation, 50 plus is enough. For publication, I would just continue to collect data. And, and you know, and, and, you know, by the time you finish writing the paper, finish analyzing it, giving your friends for feedback, and two, three rounds, you know, presenting in a conference, you have collected another 50. And then we say for publication is 100. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Skylar, do you want to ask next? Skylar? OK. Oh, OK, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, thank you, Professor. I have a question about the longitudinal model of emotion or mood or effect. Uh, you know, the emotion or mood or effect is not static, they're not slapshot. It's dynamic by definition. It's a movie. And for example, the Maryland paper begin to study the effect span. So my question is about how, how do you feel about the idea about how the emotion or affect the trajectory impact, like the engagement trajectory or venture goal trajectory. And for the method, the deep learning method, like the state of art machine learning method, I guess could be used to capture the daily emotion and we could use that method to examine how the emotion change impacts the entrepreneurial process and outcome. How do you feel about that, Professor? Wow. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a little hard to tell, you know. Um, okay, so it's hard to see what your puzzle is right now, so it's hard to answer. But I can tell you the few things that, that, that is interesting. I mean, first, uh, you know, you talk about uh, FX spin, you know, my, as you mentioned here, my paper with Marilyn. So, so clearly, you know, FX spin is, is very understudied. And yet it's important because effect spin will affect your um, sort of psychological resources. Um, I would say that the, the um, engagement, in fact, I have one paper now looking at engagement. Uh, and, and typically we find in entrepreneurship that engagement tends to, to go down, right? Because initially it's exciting and then after that, right. uh, there's problems and then your, your, your um, sort of engagement level goes down. So I thought, I think those two things are interesting, but, but but I think, you know, it's hard to, but I think you still need to work on, uh, you know, what, what is the puzzle? Uh, so that, that part would probably need a little bit more, more thinking about. Yeah. The machine language would also be interesting. In fact, as I mentioned, right, the, the PhD student uh, paper that I'm working on right now, we are, we are using kind of uh, 
uh, machine language for that purpose too. Yeah. So, so I'll say interesting questions, um, uh, but but still more work needs to to be done on clarifying what, what that puzzle is. You mean the puzzle about the topic of emotion and what was the current gap in that study so we can better communicate to that conversation? Yeah, so, so, the puzzle, so the puzzle here is, um, you know, uh, so if you say FX spin has an effect on, 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 on engagement, uh, you know, is there something surprising about it? Uh, is, there something new, is there something new that you can tell, tell, tell the audience? So that part I think needs to be worked on. So again, remember I was telling you about the situation, right? You know, this is the current situation and there's something wrong in the current situation. So I think you, what, what's still missing is there's something missing in the current situation that you're trying to solve. So that part needs to be worked out in a little bit more uh, detail. Okay, okay, thank you. Very inspiration. Thank you, Professor. Albindo, do you want to go next? Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Mo, I am uh, the PhD student of Michael Gielnik, and ah, actually my... nice, yeah, and actually nice uh, to hear you and uh, your work. Actually, my question is uh, to be a reviewer, like um, what are the um, criteria or to be a good reviewer um, at the PhD stage? Okay, so um, you should ask Michael, so say hi to Michael for me. So actually, yeah. um, what, what a part, part, part of the thing I do when I, when I, because I, because I'm an editor too. So part of the thing I do when I do a PhD class is I make my students, uh, um, I train my students on how to do reviews. Um, and then I, I, I make them do some practice reviews. And then when I, after I'm comfortable with that, you do real reviews. So my advice to you is, is ask Michael, you know, how can I start the, the review process? Um, and I think one of the big issues I see for, uh, and, and there's actually a trick, right? Because every review is about two pages. You talk about major points, you talk about minor points. And, and one of the things that I see the issue with uh, beginning reviewers is they are too much into um, the, the methods and the details, but they forget what the big picture is. So, 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 so my suggestion is focus on the big picture, like six to, six to eight points. And then after, you know, at least at least one page of that or, or even one slightly more than a page and then maybe three quarter pages on a little bit of uh, nitpicking. Yeah, but but I, I would suggest, you know, uh, in your case, definitely reach out to, to Michael Glinick and say, hey, uh, Michael, I'm interested to be a reviewer. Um, can you guide me? Can we do a couple of practice reviews? Uh, and I tell you an easy way, right? Because Michael is, is an editor, but he's also a reviewer, right? And he's busy. Say, Michael, maybe there's a paper that you, you are reviewing right now. Maybe uh, show it to me. I, I will do a first draft of a review so that when you review the paper, it's much easier. You don't have to you know, read as much because I've done some work for him, right? And then you do a few practice and Michael will say, okay, this is your review. This is what I like about it, what I don't like about it. And then you learn this process. And you do that two or three times. And after that, you're more comfortable. And then you ask Michael, Michael, can I... Can I do a real review for you? Yeah, thank you, Professor. Yeah. Vrinda, do you want to go next? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gupta. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pu. It was a lovely uh, talk. My question is on uh, justifying emerging markets. And uh, I found yeah. your paper with uh, Dr. Visa very interesting. So uh, when, uh, yeah, I'm a junior scholar. So when I start writing, how do I... Uh, you know, talk about emerging markets and how do I justify mm. that? Mm. And, and what perspective do you take? Like the OB perspective, a strategy I'm, perspective? No, or... OB perspective and gender entrepreneurship. So Gender entrepreneurship, yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. So, so, so I mean, it, yeah. So if it's gender, for instance, then, you know, of course, Visha is the expert on, on, on gender. And, and I mean, so I would, I would kind of talk a little bit about, you know, whether there's, for instance, go to the globe studies, right, and see whether there are sort of a different sort of gender expectations, uh, gender roles, uh, you know. So, so I, I will still kind of look at those those things first uh, to explain. So it still has to be a so although it's emerging market, 
the explanation still has to be a theoretical explanation. So, so maybe gender roles are different in emerging markets. And even for emerging markets, I, I would I would also advise not to you know do a study and just say about emerging markets, right? I will be more specific. Is it is it is it India? You know, is it um, uh, Africa? Right? Is it uh, South America? Okay, because emerging markets is really a, a very a broad brush. So, so I would go more specific. Talk about the country that you are studying and how you know maybe the gender norms uh, may be different in those countries um, and, and how that might play out in in uh, the explanation of uh, you know whatever you want to study. So, so, so I guess don't, don't, don't just say emerging markets, be a bit more uh, specific. So if I take up India, then I explain India through yes. Yes. several things. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So India, and when you mean um, a theoretical perspective, what if you can just elaborate that bit? Yeah. Um, so in the case of, of uh, gender, right? Uh, are gender roles in, in uh, India different? Are gender expectations uh, different? So, so those those were the things that I, I would discuss. Okay. Right, right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, Morden, I know we we asked you for forty five minutes. Are you willing to take a few more questions? We oh sure sure. I'll, yeah. I'll be delighted. Perfect. Alexander, do you want to ask? Thank you, uh, thank you, Doctor Hupta. Uh, hello, Doctor Hu. Uh, I have a uh, question to you regarding one of the research projects I have. Uh, and I, I've been working about like a one year. Uh, there is a theory in, in a applied psychology which explain uh, the difference in uh, decision-making and actually they explains like a two biases. And the source of the bias uh, for the female and male is actually the difference in the cost of the error. So there is a different cost of the error that's why the male and female uh, make the different decision how to select the partner. And I saw this is exactly the theory which can be applied for entrepreneurship to explain the diet of the venture capitalist and the uh, startup uh, developer. Because one has the high cost of the horror and the other actually can pitch uh, uh, the new idea, new startup uh, probably each month and just to make a nice presentation. And I was thinking to merge this with uh, multi-level theory of decision-making. It's a very old theory like a Hollenbeck and others to explain the decision-making accuracy. So there is like a core construct which explains the decision-making accuracy. And I thought that these two biases, the, like the gender generated biases, will actually moderate the relationship between the core construct. Uh, do you think uh, I'm selecting the, the proper, like a DV and the proper theory for the main, um, uh, main effect? And that's the first question. And the second question do you believe that such research design can, can fly as a theoretical, fully conceptual paper? Or uh, to prove it, I need to collect about 100 teams and present also the empirical evidence. Thank you for your conceptual and applied answer. Yeah, um, you know, I think I think I think Gisha mentioned right. I think you mentioned it in your talk, and I totally uh, agree uh, that I think it's it's good to to go for uh, empirical paper first. For, for PhD students, uh, because it's tremendously difficult to publish a conceptual paper. Uh, so, 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 to, so my short answer is, especially a topic like biases and uh, gender, there's, there's been quite a lot of theorizing. Uh, so I think it's often difficult to write a theory paper around it. So, so I would definitely suggest uh, empirical paper. And, and uh, I know you mentioned about teams. I mean, it, well, but the, the, the theoretical issue is still about the cost of the error, right? Uh, and male and female. So, so if you design an empirical paper, it may not need to be a team paper. It's, it can be at an individual level, right? Because uh, it's really about uh, the, the biases. Mm -hmm. yeah. The part that I didn't really get was, um, how does the multi-level play in this, uh, in this picture? Because what I hear from you is that, 
um, for males and females, there, there are differences in the cause of the errors, uh, and therefore uh, the, the VC would make decisions differently. Is that right? Yeah, so basically, um... Uh, there is a theory in applied psychology which explains the, how the male and female uh, behave differently. Mm -hmm. I, uh, the main idea is to use this theory to say that actually the, uh, the person who pitched the project is a male because he, has a, he or she uh, has the low cost of error and the venture capitalist has the high cost of error that's why okay. actually they take the female type of a bias. And uh, um, so b basically saying that the venture capitalist is a female and uh, the startup developer is a male. And I was asking what would be the best theory to, to use uh, um, these two biases as a moderators. For example, I was thinking about like a main effect on the decision-making accuracy. And there is a theory which explains how the team make uh, better decisions. And maybe you can advise like another theory which can be um, merged with this, uh, the main idea. Thank you. I, yeah, so, so I mean, often I cannot tell you a theory, but what I do suggest is to look at the work of Laura Huang. So Laura, of course, was one of your guest speakers, I think, uh, you know, couple, uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago. So Laura does a lot of work about how uh, uh, men and women um, sort of present their ideas differently and there are different sort of expectations of uh, men and women. And, and because of this, uh, the, the, the investors have different preferences for, uh, for men and women. So, so instead of saying a particular theory, I would say go go look at sort of Laurel Wang's work, and I think you get you get a lot of good ideas on how to proceed. Thank you. Thanks, Ashika. You want to go next? Thank you, Professor Gupta. Uh, hello, Professor Pu. Uh, so, actually, my question is just uh, 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 part up on Hemanidhi's question. I just wanted to know if there's an experiment on teams and let's say if it's a two cross five, okay? And then for every cell, we're trying to, what is the ideal number to have for every cell? Because if it's a team, even mm. if I have, let's say five members in a team, so yes. that'll probably make my number to, if I have, let's say 10 teams per cell, that, that'll mm. make the number to what? Uh, 50, 50 into 10, 500. So, so what's the ideal number per cell for a team that we should have for a dissertation? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a tough question, right? Because, because when you do analysis, right? Uh, if your team is your uh, analysis, then your power statistics do not change just because you have a team, right? Um, exactly. And then per cell, they say that minimum should be 30. But then if I put 30, yes. With five members, that's 150, and then that's 1,500 yes. people. Yeah. It's almost impossible. Yeah, so you know, I'm, I'm a team researcher, uh, but sometimes I cheat a little bit. And what do I mean by cheating? By, by looking at an individual issue within a team, and then my unit analysis becomes the individual. So I'll look at, I'll change my research question slightly and, and, and uh, so for instance, you know, instead of saying, um, say uh, how passion in the team, um, how passion in the team uh, influences say outcomes, and then it's a team level construct. I would study about, you know, how each in individual sort of um, deviation from the team sort of average influences that first uh, uh, sort of, um, uh, venture outcomes, right? So if my if my uh, sort of DV uh, sort of uh, independent, if my IV is each individual's deviation from the mean of the team, then really it's an individual level uh, analysis. Yeah. So so if you if you want to do something like this, I would suggest uh, seeing whether you can can study an uh, issue of an individual embedded in a team. Yeah, because statistics won't change just because you're doing a team level analysis, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. 
Shridhar, do you want to go next? Thank, thank you, Professor Gupta. Thank you, Professor Ko. I'm a research scholar in OB, uh, and I'm doing research on self-managed teams from India. Uh, my question is, um, do, you, do you think that self-managed team exists in entrepreneurship also? I'm sorry, I missed your question. Your, the last part, of, do I think? Do you think that uh, self-managed teams exist in entrepreneurship also? When the entrepreneur oh, is in the, in the infant stage or when it is very small, where the startups are there. Uh, yeah. So it yeah. definitely is a self-managed team. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so if I paraphrase, uh, do I think that self-managed teams, uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurship, is that, is that accurate? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so actually, um, actually, that, that, that would be an excellent research question. In fact, um, I, I didn't get down to doing it because of, of, of the lack of uh, resources. But, um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to look at was that, um, the idea of shared leadership in, in startup yes. teams. So, so definitely those, those are kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's an ideal context to study self-managed team, right? I mean, you know, one of the things I like to show when I teach my OB class is the uh, office orchestra where there's no sort of a conductor, right? And in some sense, a, a startup is like this, right? There, there's no yes. real conductor and yet all the team functions or the um, has to be performed and it's not necessarily performed by one individual, but it's distributed within the different team members. Yeah. So that's, that's actually a very ideal uh, setting to study questions of shared leadership, um, self-management of teams. I'm doing that and I'll come back to you. Thank you. Thanks. So model, we are getting close to an hour of your time. So I'm going to transition into the last question, which is what is one advice you have for aspiring entrepreneurship researchers? Wow. Um, I think entrepreneurship among the many divisions, even in academy, is, is one of the most uh, welcoming uh, divisions. And part of the reason why I never left. Uh, so my typical advice for, for, for the uh, people is that, you know, uh, regardless of your theoretical perspective, regardless of whether you uh, see yourself an entrepreneurship scholar or you just happen to be one like me, uh, um, you know, always keep your at least one foot in the entrepreneurship uh, uh, door because whatever your theoretical perspective, I can bet you that there is a question in entrepreneurship research that uh, is, uh, is waiting for you to answer. Hey, thank you, Model. On that note, uh, thank you very much for your time today, and we really appreciate you patiently answering everyone's questions. Right. Thanks, thanks, you, Visha. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's been fun, and, and you know, good to see everyone. And I know it's late night there, so have a good night. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. So, guys, that's the end of the official uh, session for today. I'll stick around to answer any questions. Uh, and I'm happy to answer questions. I noticed there were a few questions in the chat box. Uh, so if you're still around, feel free to ask. Uh, <laughs> Vishal, sir, I have a question. Devakar, uh, yes. go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, I'm a research scholar doing uh, my research in social entrepreneurship area. So uh, I would like to uh, know about the events uh, which every early PhD scholar doing research in social entrepreneurship should focus. And my uh, next question is regarding uh, in your book, uh, uh, Great Minds in Entrepreneurship Research and even the two 2016 paper that is Entrepreneurship Research in Management and Organizational Studies. We see that uh, there is, uh, I mean, Westernization hegemony of uh, uh, entrepreneurial uh, research. So, uh, if I want to um, uh, justify a contextual uh, things in city India, how how can we justify against the Western hegemony uh, in in in, in uh, entrepreneurship uh, research? So, what was your first question, Devakar? 
sir the first was regarding uh, what are the events uh, important events that every early phd scholar doing research in social entrepreneurship should focus I'm not sure what you mean by events, but for example, talk to Sadek after this session. Sadek is participating later in a seminar on uh, on social entrepreneurship that Tom Lumpkin does, and usually it is held in person, but because of COVID, it is being held online. So I always tell people that before you can contribute to the research conversation, you need to make sure you have good training and attending those seminars where you know, you're gonna have like-minded researchers and professors learning and talking and discussing about social entrepreneurship research. That's sort of the first, uh, first step. I, have, I am told that there are similar social entrepreneurship seminars in, uh, in some European universities too that are being offered online these days because of COVID. Again, talk to Sadek. And I think he's done some digging around in this area. Your next question was about sort of what should researchers from India or other emerging markets do or other non-traditional contexts do given the, you know, what you call the North American hegemony. And my response to that is that, yes, it is true that most these reviewers and editors tend to be from North America. And I think part of the reason is that reviewers and editors from other, so I work with, with many Indian scholars and I can tell you that may, very few of them follow my encouragement of reviewing for journals, okay? When I tell them to review for journals, they find an excuse not to do it, okay? So the hegemony is not because someone is sort of imposing the hegemony. The hegemony is because of sort of uh, different uh, mindset that I see in, in these different contexts. Uh, so, so, okay, having said that, what can you do? Look, whenever you are identifying any context that where you want to do your research, it's your job as a researcher to lay out the context in as clear and transparent way as possible, in a way that's interesting for other people, okay? In a way that's the reader of your paper, when they read it, they say, oh, that is so interesting. In, in, in the early 2000s, JBV published a very, very interesting paper on entrepreneurial activity and opportunity identification in Sri Lanka, okay? And if you email me afterwards, I'm happy to share it with you. It's in JBV. And if you, and, and in Sri Lanka, they looked at a very poor community in Sri Lanka, okay? So, the, you know, of course somebody could say, well, this is a, even in Sri Lanka, this is like a really poor community, right? So what's the generalizability? But when you read the paper, they lay out the context so well that I can speak for myself, and I'm assuming the editor too, found that finds the paper very interesting. You will find the paper very interesting to read. You will almost forget that it's about Sri Lanka and this context. So interesting is the story of the paper that they write in the paper. So I think that's the way to be, uh, is ask yourself what's interesting about this context? Why do I want to study the phenomena in this context? And now how can I make the person excited about, make the reader, the editor and the reviewer excited about this context? So, uh, so that's the way to go. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Radha, do you have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, partially you replied right now my answer. My question is about the reviewer. Like, suppose if I'm interested, how can I get the opportunity? I already am reviewing one of the journals in India, but uh, about others like options, I'm not aware. So will you please elaborate in detail? Yeah, so there are, there are a few ways. First is, are you a PhD student or a professor? Yeah, I'm a professor. Sir. I have completed my already doctorate degree. So if you are a professor, the best way I would suggest to you is, um, 
let's say you're interested in emotions research and entrepreneurship let's say reach yes, out sir. to someone like dr fu and say i would like to volunteer to review papers in you, you know papers in emotions research and entrepreneurship i know you are an editor you know please keep me in mind for any reviews okay or if you are interested in research methods reach out to someone like brian anderson with the same message right now notice that for them at this stage you are an unknown commodity okay right, sir. they don't even know if they will send you if they send you a paper if you will even do it okay forget whether you will do a good job or a bad job they don't know okay correct sir so be prepared that in the beginning they may give you a paper on which they couldn't find any good reviewer right i i give people the example of the film industry right today if you or i or anyone goes to bomb you know film industry hollywood or bombay or whatever right anywhere in the world it's not like we will start by getting the best parts in the movie right, right we will sir. probably get like some small part in the movie okay and if we do well then comes the next step correct okay. sir so that's how it is also volunteer to review for conferences so for example i encourage the phd students at alabama to review for southern management association eastern management association academy of management is a great place to start because they get thousands of papers every year and they are always looking for the viewers uh, so if you talk to swati you will hear that when uh, when someone is working with me i encourage them to review for uh, academy of management volunteer to review uh, to sign up when that in, in email comes out so that's the way to to get started with with the reviewing okay so so for academy of management can i like contact directly i can drop the mail and for academy of management when the email comes out you just sign up and swati can show you how to sign up uh, okay. and you know they 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 can yeah you just go but for journals then you can reach out to people like uh, you know model fu or brian anderson or uh, you know other people who are sort of editors in the area in which you are interested right sir right thank you sir thank you very much sadek question dr gupta not a question like i just wanted to tell you that the social entrepreneurship seminar is actually happening in person this year also oh they i thought uh, it was going to be online oh no it's in chicago okay so if if our uh, if uh, divaka reaches out to him can you uh, reaches out to you can you share with him sort of your readings uh, for the seminar and you know explain to him like what the seminar is about and all that yeah for sure thank you thank you sunita question yes sir uh, thank you so much it's always a pleasure to listen to you uh, one thing that i was wondering is you know i realize in fact an academic's life is far far stressful or busier than a corporate life i mean that's how i am seeing it because you know you teach for teaching you prepare and then you write and then you also review and so the and the process is a never ending process and amidst all that i also see you actually also holding these kind of sessions and encouraging students and replying to each one of them so i was really amazed at you know how do you manage your time and, and how do you manage to get to do these things you know and i think there's a great lesson for all of us to learn from there thank you sunita when you said your initial comment about how it's nice to hear uh, to what i have to say if you had told me you were going to say that i would have asked my wife to sit in the session so that you know <laughs> she's always telling me i talk too much so so that would have been good for her to hear but but coming back to your question i think we all struggle with time management i think i sort of subscribe to the 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 school of the school of thought that uh dean shefford lays out in his book which is that you think about the papers that you're working on and you work on them every day okay now every day doesn't mean 7 days a week 365 days a year that's not what i'm talking about but every day means just because i'm teaching today doesn't mean 
I get a holiday from research. Okay. So that's sort of the first thing. Every day you need to give at least X number of hours, whether it's two hours, whether it's four, whether it's six, whatever works for you. And I see for a lot of PhD students, when they start teaching, they think, oh, I'm teaching Monday. I shouldn't do, I, I don't have time to do research on Monday. That, that, that's not a good way to think. So that's what I would say first. Second is, it is true that we have a busy life. I, I agree with that. But the good thing about this life is that you have the flexibility in terms of time. Okay, so after this session, if I feel like going for a walk for 45 minutes or 30 minutes alone or with my wife, I can go. In, in industry or if I was running my own business, that's not always uh, possible. Uh, so the good thing about this profession is the, the flexibility of time. And I hope that you know, we can encourage more sort of people to, to join in this effort. And yet, yet, even as you're writing papers, even as you're sort of re responding to reviews, responding to emails, you always have to keep in mind what your goals are in terms of this profession. For example, you know, uh, my co-authors and I are talking about sort of the next book we are writing, right? The next book we want to write. So there always has to be sort of the next goal. Yet, as Sadiq said in the beginning, if you become 100% about writing books, then, you know, you're not contributing to the, to the research papers. And I think he brought that up in the beginning of the session. But if you stop contributing research papers, that sort of limits your ability to be a researcher. Writing books sort of is, is a different sort of ball game. So you always have to also think, okay, how can I you know, make sure that I am writing papers? I am reviewing papers. So when I tell my audience to review papers, I also review papers and Modern also reviews papers and Brian Anderson also reviews papers yeah. and Laura Huang also reviews papers. So you just have to sort of, you know, find your own time management uh, as best as you can. Okay, thank you. Because I, I feel, uh, I am because there are times I'm trying to segment my time and then I realize sometimes the segmentation works, sometimes the segmentation doesn't work. So uh, it was also in, in that sense. Of course, thank you. of course, it's, it's you know, it, it, Time management, you know, I've heard Warren Buffett say this. I've heard Amitabh Bachchan say this. I've heard, uh, you know, I've heard, you know, Barack Obama say this. You know, time management is what they struggle with the most, right? So when I sort of think about my struggle, I, you know, I sort of tell myself, well, we are not that successful, right? So, you know, how much can our struggle be compared to those people? And so, you know, we just sort of do the best, uh, do the best we can. Um, and the key is, I think, to be consistent, like every day do it. And I think that sort of leads you to accomplish, finish more. But thank you, Sunita. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Adarsh, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Professor Gupta. Uh, so I just need a quick clarification. Uh, how do you see the difference between the context and the lens? So the context is... so. Okay, so the lens is the theory, okay? So for example, role congruity theory, when I do gender research, right? It could be social role theory, it could be role congruity theory, it could be, uh, you know, like uh, Laura Huang's paper that I shared had regulatory focus theory. So that's the lens. The context is, for example, in Laura Huang's paper that I shared with you, the context I think was uh, entrepreneurial pitches to venture capitalists, right? Uh, you could have a different context. For example, you could have pitches to judges in your own institution's business plan competition. That could be the context, but still use the same lens. Or you could have the same lens VCs and pitches and use a different uh, lens. So you could have, so that's the difference between the lens, which is the theory, and the context, which is where are you studying the, 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 the research question. And you could study the same research question with different lenses, or you could use the same lens to study the research question in different contexts. Uh, can I ask a follow-up question on the same Go ahead. question? 
Yeah, so uh, in, in entrepreneurship research, we mostly draw from so, uh, sociology, psychology, and economics. So the theoretical lens is coming from either of these, you know, uh, theoretical basis. Uh, so entrepreneurship is the phenomena, and the lens, again, you're saying could be, you know, uh, as the VC lens, or it could be virtual lens. Uh, am I understanding this correctly? Yeah, so, so when you think of entrepreneurship as the phenomenon, as several speakers have brought up, right? Then you are, you know, in, in some way, sort of at a high level of abstraction, right? Because even within entrepreneurship, we know it could be, you know, entrepreneurial pitches to VC, it could be business plans, it could be, you know, as, as, as Sadiq is interested, entrepreneurship among poor people, it could be entrepreneurship among serial entrepreneurs, right? So even within the phenomenon, sort of you could have these sub phenomenon, right? And lenses, you are right. Uh, you know, are you studying it from a sociological perspective, psychological perspective, economic perspective? And then within sort of each of those perspectives, you can have different sort of theoretical lenses, right? Uh, so does that help? And now I've, I'm also needing to understand the perspective, context, and lens. I, I think, I think, uh, I think the, the three words itself is not what's important because you could have different levels, right? Entrepreneurship as a phenomenon, sure. But within that phenomenon, you can have like different types of entrepreneurship, right? Different sort of, like when you say entrepreneur, right? That word itself includes Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, but it also includes the neighborhood store where you go buy your products, right? Or it includes the plumber who comes to your house if you know the plumber is, you know, a self-employed individual, right? So that's sort of the context, right? Which yeah, why I'm asking, asking this is context. yeah, sorry, please, please go ahead. Yeah. Go no, ahead. so I, I got a, I got a feedback on uh, on one of my papers where I think I've shared this uh, paper with you as well, where I'm talking about entrepreneurial teams, trust and virtuality. Now uh, the feedback I got was they asked me to get the, the context, you know, they want some more clarification on the context. So I'm just thinking, is virtuality my context or entrepreneurial team is the context? Because the base uh, I'm using is trust, which is again coming from, uh, you know, psychological uh, base I'm, I've taken. So so I don't recall the paper. I'm sorry, I, I get tons of papers, you know, on the, so I don't recall the paper, but, but, it could be that if you're if you're studying virtual teams, that's what they need more sort of information about. So what kind of teams are they? What tasks are they doing? Are they artificial teams made for the purpose of your research or are they teams that already exist and you have sort of gone in to study them? What kind of outcomes are these teams expected to produce in, in their natural setting? They, I'm assuming that the purpose of these teams is something other than just providing data for your research, right? These teams are actually doing some tasks. So what is those tasks? Who are the members of those teams? Are they all men? Are they all women? Are they mixed? Are they multinational? Are they single nation? Uh, are they teams within you know, multinational corporations? Are they teams that are actually working on entrepreneurship projects like freelance? So. I think that's what reviewers usually mean when they want to see more context. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marishka, I see that you have a comment here. Do you want to share your comment on camera? Hi there. <laughs> yes, um, hello. Uh, re reviewing, I've, I've done a handful of reviews and I've gotten better. <laughs> with each one. I feel very, <laughs> very dedicated to being developmental, being kind and being developmental. And I feel confident in my first review. When they return it is when I start to feel like an imposter, <laughs> especially when they return it. And it's a, it's a tome. It's a mini book. <laughs> I think I got twice where it was 18 pages long and, and they're arguing a point And I realized that they're the expert in that area. I have more shallow understanding and then I find myself, you know, needing to do a, a mini research to be adequate in the conversation and addressing it. And I, I don't know, I, I definitely see the value in starting and building up the scale with conferences. Um, 
but if you have any feedback with these R and Rs when they become the second and third round. So, so Manishka, you raise a very good point, which is, I am told by old timers, people who've been in this profession way longer than I have. I've been in this profession since 2002, but you know, people who've been sort of my mentors and other folks, they tell me that the response letters have become much, have the length of the response letters has increased over time tremendously. They tell me that response letters used to be, you know, three pages or four pages. And now when I send my response letters and I get response letters, they are 18 pages, 25 pages, you know, 35 pages, sometimes even longer than the paper itself. <laughs> and as, as, a, as, a, as an author, I always wonder, like, man, somebody's going to make the time to read not only my 50 or 40 page paper, but also my 60 page, 40 page response letter. I mean, that, that's amazing, right? And of course, over time, you find sort of, as a reviewer, you find sort of shortcuts. And what do I mean by that? Some reviewers I've heard will go straight to the response letter and they will see if you've answered as an author each of their, each of the issues they raise. And if they are satisfied with that, then they generally sign off on the paper. Some authors will generally, some reviewers will generally go to the paper and their idea is, I'm going to read the paper with fresh eyes. Mm -hmm. And if I'm satisfied with sort of the paper with fresh eyes, then I might go and look at sort of, you know, my specific comments. But if I'm not generally satisfied with the paper, then it doesn't matter what I said in my previous comments, because I'm still not happy with the paper. So I think reviewers sort of vary on that. But you make a very good point that the review letters can be long. And so instead of starting by volunteering for journals, especially the top journals, uh, it's, it's always good to start sort of with conference reviews like AOM, where you don't have the back and forth, you just have the one, uh, one stage reviews. Uh, and of course, then you, as you get more experience. But believe me, at the good journals, I think many of us reviewers who want to do it conscientiously and constructively feel the imposter syndrome of, oh my God, all I said to you was address instrumental variable analysis. And you've given me so much that now I need to go read five papers on instrumental variable analysis because I'm not sure I know what it is anymore. So I think it's good to have that humble attitude. And I think that that shows that you're headed in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Amit, question? Good evening, sir. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, sir, I have asked uh, the same question in the mail. Sir, since I am a very new young faculty, and uh, now since the PhD program has been extended even to the management and entrepreneurship department, so I would be getting a PhD scholar. So since all over the period of time, I have been a scholar. Now I'm getting into the newer shoes. So I feel, uh, will it be very much conflicting for me to give a topic to a student or what should be the processor? And if there is some literature, some good book on how to guide as a faculty member, as a new faculty to your PhD student. So that's where I, I am in a bit of a lot of Delma. This seminar, I have been writing your points in my diary. I'm noting it down. So I think that they are also helping me. But again, I, I feel that overall, how you guide you, the young PhD students. So that's what. So Amit, in terms of young faculty or new faculty, one of the common mistakes I think people make, and perhaps I was like that as a young faculty too, I cannot say, is that people think that as soon as they get sort of PhD students of their own as a professor, if they, when they get PhD students of their own, that research will become easier, okay? In fact, the opposite happens, especially when you're junior faculty yourself. Yes. Being assigned PhD students as a junior faculty actually increases your work because now you also have to guide them when you are sort of struggling at the same time. And so my advice to sort of 
junior professors is first, don't start ambitious projects with new PhD students. Start a simple project, even if it doesn't go to a very good journal, but goes to like a middling journal or an easy journal, that's okay, but start small, okay? There are several reasons for that, and I guess we can talk about that later. But start with sort of a small project. So that's one. Second, if you already have an ongoing project, try to involve the PhD student in that project rather than giving them a new project to start. And people think that I say this to make life easier for PhD students, but no, I'm saying this also to make life easier for the faculty. Because if you are working on a project, now to guide the PhD student, you have to read in that area and learn best practices in that area. So it's much easier if that new project is sort of part of your own project rather than in a different area. So let, let me just use some example. Let's say you do team research and your PhD student says, I want to do you know, venture capitalism. Instead of saying, let me advise you on how to do venture capitalist research, which you don't know about yet, it's best to say, sure, do VC research on the side, but with me, get involved in team research. So you learn how research is done and then take those best practices as PhD student to apply to VC research. So that's sort of my two, uh, two advice. And my third advice is meet regularly with the PhD student. I am so surprised when I see faculty who think that they told the PhD student to go do X and now the PhD student will come back with X done. It, it doesn't work that way. I, I wish it did, but it, it doesn't. It's like, it, it's like you are coaching them and coaching, you know, read books written about like sports coaching, which, which I've read several. And what one of the things you see is that you have to be involved with the, with the person you are coaching, involved meaning like on a regular basis. You cannot say, go run a 500, 400 meter and when you win a medal, come back and then we'll talk next. I mean, that you, you can't do that. And the, you, can't do the, you cannot do the same thing in academia too. And I think you need to meet with PhD students regularly. If, if, if you cannot meet them every like two days or three days, at least once a week, uh, and you have to be prepared that they may come to you and they say, especially in the first year or the second year, I don't know how to do this. Uh, and then you have to find a resource for them so that they can go figure out how to do this. Uh, I'll give you an example. So these days in strategy sort of macro research, almost every journal will tell you, good journal will tell you endogeneity is a problem, right? So you have to address that problem sort of before they tell you that. You have to do PSM, uh, propensity score matching, instrumental variable analysis, exogenous shock, and so on. A first year PhD student cannot do that, okay? But you cannot just send them and say, go do this because they will do it. I mean, if, if they feel like you're pressuring them to do it, they will just do it wrong. And then, you know, you, your name is on the paper. So you have to understand that they cannot do it and you have to find people, if you don't know how to do it yourself, you have to find people who will sit down with them and guide them and advise them on how to do it. Now, how do you find that person? Sometimes you have to give them co-authorship and that's okay, that's their role in the paper is to advise on that particular method, even if it's, you know, even if it's in exchange of co-authorship. Sometimes it may not be co-authorship on this paper, but you might have to give them co-authorship on a different paper. And that's all right also. Or it could be you guide my, you advise my PhD student and I'll help you out with your PhD student. You know, that's all arrangements you can make. But I think it has to be like close involvement with the PhD student, not hands-off. I don't think hands-off works very well at most institutions. Uh, it, it doesn't. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, Navinita, do you have a question, Krishnan? Yeah, good evening and uh, uh, sorry, uh, good morning to you and uh, thanks thanks for this uh, opportunity. Uh, my question is, uh, I, am, I am having a doubt on connecting research with the theoretical lens. 
uh, is it that first I identify the theoretical lens which I need to study and then formulate a research question accordingly, or I identify the research question, find a, a result, and then see which theoretical lens would be appropriate. So how should I go about it? Or does both developing research question solution and the theoretical lens, all three go hand in hand uh, so, when I have to write a paper or do a research. This is I, I know you, you sent me an email about this too, and I'm sorry I didn't respond. Uh, it's, you know, it's been overwhelming, but, but let me respond now um, to this question. I think of this as somewhat like a film, right? What comes first, the script or the choice of actors or, you know, other choices that I'm going to make in the movie, right? And you will find examples of all different iterations. You will find people who sort of, uh, you know, uh, had the research question figured out and then they went and said, okay, let's look at what theory would be the best. Where should I collect data for this? So that's one option. You will also find people who, who say, okay, I have this really, really cool data. Now let me figure out what would be a good research question for this data, okay? And if I have the results that I have, what would be a good theoretical lens for this paper, okay? So th th that also happens. Um, the third thing that, and I think Model Fu brought this up today, which I thought was really helpful because he brought it up. Sometimes when you write a paper, the data is what you have, right? It's highly unlikely that you can sort of abandon that data and go with something else, right? Especially if you took six months or eight months or four months to collect it, right? But the theoretical lens you can change. So, you know, you may write, start writing a paper in role congruity theory and then decide, no, it doesn't really, you know, the, the, I couldn't, first is, it is, the story doesn't appeal to me. I wrote it with role congruity theory, but what if the paper doesn't seem right to me? Or I sent it to friendly feedback, let's say to others, and others said, uh, no, I don't think this theory really fits. I think if you go look at social dominance theory, that fits better. Oh, but I don't know anything about social dominance theory. So now I have a choice. Either I can go read it or I can say, mm, I'll ignore what others says and I'll just try it at a, dip, at a journal. Most of us would actually go, let's go read social dominance theory and then decide if it fits or not. So th that's sort of the, the way to, to be. So, you know, in the PhD program, when you learn how to write papers, they tell you write an introduction, then write the theory, then write the methods. What they, what they never tell you is that you are actually going back and forth all the time. Mm -hmm. Changing the methods, how you write them, changing the theory, how you write it. Once you change the theory, then you also have to change the discussion so you're constantly going back and forth uh, in the paper. And I think that, that that's what it is. Uh, it, it, so, yeah. Now, of course, I think you're a PhD student, right? You're still in the PhD? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm still a PhD. Yeah. yeah. So for PhD students, I think some of this, you can also sort of observe in action as you work with a professor, which is, you know, when you work with a professor, one way is to say, professor, give me some little piece of this paper to do, I'll do it, and that's my role. The other is to say, I want to learn the whole process. So when the professor says, let me switch the, th let me change the theory here. Instead of saying, okay, you say, help me understand how you decided that, how you made that decision. Why did you make that decision? I'm not questioning your decision, but I want to understand why you made that decision. And that sort of helps you. And sometimes, let's say others gives me social dominance theory, I go use it. The reviewer might still say, I don't like social dominance theory. I think social role theory is better. And you go, oh man, that was what I started with. <laughs> so you go back and use, you know, but remember what I said first day of class, even when you go back to social role theory, you are no longer the same person because yeah, now you know it. more. 
Yes. And you say, okay, how can how does my paper enrich social voluntary in a way that I hadn't thought about before? That's the so, way. so so we just uh, appropriate to the situation. We take a call and then we go ahead and see how finally the story gets uh, fixed between the results and the theoretical connection. Yes. Okay. So you start by saying, okay, you know, you start with something, right? What is my, what is, what is the theoretical lens I think would be the best for this paper? Ah, correct. correct. Okay. What is the data that I think I need to collect? Then once you've done that, then you start sending the paper to conferences. You start circulating the paper to people who might give you some feedback, which is very difficult to find, by the way. Uh, people who will give you honest feedback on the paper. Uh, and then you, you, you change it. Uh, mm. I, I see so many young people who are sort of stubborn. They, they fall in love with their own idea. And I think when you write a paper, you have to remember, you, you shouldn't fall in love with your own idea. You should be willing to change and tweak and alter it based on what you are hearing from the other people at conferences at journals, uh, and then, yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Professor, thank you. Thank you. Purnima, you have a question? Yes, sir, thank you so much. So my question is actually related to today's agenda, like philosophy of uh, philosophy in entrepreneurship research. So during literature, uh, we have so many labels, like we have theory, we have view, like resource-based view, knowledge-based view, then we have perspective, then we have paradigms. So my question is that how these labels are different and it is important for us to learn, I mean, are the same or how to take yeah. all these terms? I think your question is somewhat similar to what others asked, somewhat. So what you're asking is people use words like resource-based perspective. Some say resource-based view. Yeah. Some say resource-based theory. theory. Does it really matter? And yeah. my response to you is, in some ways, it doesn't matter, okay? Because there's always debate about, there's ongoing debate, to be honest, about whether, let's pick resource-based. Is it a full-fledged theory? Well, to yeah. decide that, then I need to know what a theory is. But once you start looking at what a theory is, you realize there's no debate, there's no agreement on what a theory actually is. And how do you assess a theory? So if all you're doing is using resource-based in your paper, it doesn't matter whether it's a perspective or a view or a theory. If all you're doing is using insights from the resource-based literature in your theory. Now, okay. if your paper is about whether resource-based view is a theory, like Prem and Butler 2001, yeah. then of course you have to get into what's the difference between a view and a theory and a perspective. Okay. But I think those papers are way are far fewer than you know we would expect. Very few papers actually get into that sort of philosophical debate. Um, for Gulshan was on the call. I don't know if she's still on the call. We recently wrote a paper about stereotype threat theory, and you know in the paper we explain sort of what a theory is. But that sort of one one interpretation of what a theory is. Other people would define the theory differently. And so, you know, the, but I think, I mean, that those debates are very sort of esoteric. And I would suggest like, you know, young uh, to, to PhD students or junior scholars, unless they really want to contribute to sort of, you know, that discussion, right? There's no point in getting into that debate. That's like a black hole that will suck your time and energy. Um, so, you know, is stereotype threat theory really a theory or is it simply a perspective? I think unless that sort of your research interest is specifically that, there's no point in getting into that. Yeah, all right. Thank, thank you. you. Raj, do you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you, Professor Gupta. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So actually, uh, two questions, but partially they have been answered. One issue raised by Mariska and uh, about reviewing. And another is raised by Amit about supervising. So I'm supervisor of a couple of students. Uh, 
Uh, the challenge uh, here is uh, students come out come with the different topics, particularly in entrepreneurship, and it's difficult to get the students uh, uh, in entrepreneurship per se. So here is like one my student is working on uh, institutional theory on entrepreneurship, another on uh, entrepreneurial competencies. So my uh, I have got the answers uh, while you were responding to Amit's uh, query. Uh, what my just suggestion or request that can we have a session on uh, supervising doctoral students? Uh, That's let me think yeah. about that. That would be, I mean, in this yeah. seminar series, we cannot because we finish next week. But yeah. but Later on. during October or November, we could have one session on, you know, where we invite people who've had good success with supervising doctoral students, and they sim they talk about simply supervising doctoral students. We, we could certainly have, have a session sort of in, in that domain. One thing I, I try to tell doctoral students here, and I think you know the, the same applies to doctoral students in most countries. Good supervision is not just means you need to be a good sort of supervisor. For good supervision, you also need to be a good supervisee, right? So the supervisor can try whatever, but you know the, the audience, the, the student has to be receptive also. So it's a two-way street, right? You know, you know, so so that's sort of one thing to keep in mind that it's it's a two-way street. The other thing I tell PhD students, and I've said this to Sadek and I've said this to others on this session too, in, in this forum too. Ask yourself. Who are the productive faculty in your PhD program? Okay. And go work with them. That is the path for more productivity, regardless of whether they are working in your area or not, in what you think is your area. Okay. That's the path to more productivity. The other side of this is I love. X area, let's say you're a student and you think I love X, whatever that X area is. Even if there is no one in my institution or in my network who can guide me, I still want to continue to work in that area. If you want to take that approach, that's fine. But know that that's a high risk approach. Okay. If you, so look at Scott Shane, for example, let's just go with someone who has won the Nobel Prize in entrepreneurship, you know, the Global Award for Entrepreneurship Research, someone who has books on entrepreneurship research, someone who has the most cited papers in entrepreneurship research. Look at his first paper. Look at his second paper. His first paper was on uh, the debate between, uh, uh, the debate, be uh, his first paper was on leadership and with Robert House. Okay, nothing to do with entrepreneurship. But when you get to learn from someone like Robert House, you take that opportunity. Okay, doesn't mean you change your own research interest. You may, you may not, but you take the opportunity to learn. And, you know, his, his early, his first or second paper was on individual culture and entrepreneurship research. And you can see the influence is of the professors who were there. Okay. And of course, later he came up with, you know, the Shane 2000, you know, one of the most cited papers, Shane and Venkat Raman, you know, so, so supervising has two components, right? The supervisor and the supervisee, and both of them have to be thoughtful in terms of what they can sort of do, because one way is not going to work. As we say, you can bring a horse to the water, but you can't make the horse drink the water, right? You can be the best supervisor in the world, but if your supervisee doesn't want to learn, there's not much you can do about it. Uh, so I think, I think, I think that matters too. Uh, and that's what I sort of, I would, I would advise. But we will, I think your suggestion is well taken. We will try to have a session of the sort you just said, uh, but later in the, in, in the year. Thank you. Thank you. Sunita? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, the conversations triggered two questions in me. One is, uh, recently, I had submitted a paper where I was talking about the metaphysical notion of a paradigm. And the 
editors asked me what is, all of them were desk reject and then they said what is a theoretical basis for your paradigm and i was a little flummoxed because when you're talking of paradigmatic assumptions paradigmatic assumptions don't have a theoretical basis they are coming from the different strands which are getting woven into a paradigm so i was not sure how to handle that particular question that got repeated at least three times in all the three desk rejects so so sunita there's a couple of issues here and again i would like to remind everyone that the official session is over so if you want to leave that's fine uh, please feel free to leave i don't want people to think the session just drags on and on it doesn't i just want to make sure i answer all the questions that people have so sunita there's a few issues here first is when you when someone is getting the same comments across journals the same yeah. critical comments that means the problem is not sort of in the eyes of who's reading it the problem is in the paper okay so that that's a given uh, when it's the same comment so that that's my first response second is i mean i haven't read your paper and i i, I don't know much about it so i'll just go with sort of what you told me which yeah. is it it may be that what they are trying to get at is is it you saying that these are the paradigmatic assumptions or is there a what's the basis of your inference that these are the paradigmatic assumptions that that's first second what are the basis for how do you resolve those conflicting paradigmatic assumptions like is there a particular lens theory that allows you to sort of resolve those paradigmatic assumptions or are you saying you know take my sort of word for how to resolve these mm, i think yeah. that's the struggle in conceptual papers often that i see i'm assuming your paper is conceptual right yes yes it is so so that's a common struggle i see almost the writer is saying take my word for it uh they don't write but it's almost like every sentence is like in my view in my thinking in my no that will not be yeah so I, i think that may be what's going on but without looking at your paper i yeah. I, i don't know how to say what else sure sure so, so uh, and so another uh, the question which flows is okay so when we were talking about okay which theory to uh, which theoretical lens or which theory to use in a particular paper so uh, i think even more fundamentally the question for me is okay as maybe as i am doing the literature review of the field i see what are the different theories different authors are using and that's how i get to know a list of theories maybe some of them might fit or none of them might fit from that when I'm, so is there something that i need to do in addition to um, know the various theories in the field apart from gaining that knowledge from the uh, literary especially i'm mean, i'm also wondering if it's something ground up well so th- th- there's there's two there's sort of two things one is what you just described which is when you review a literature what theories do you see so let's say if someone was interested in you know gender entrepreneurship research right they could look at what theories are being used but the other is sort of what theory do you bring to the field from your disciplinary training let's say you're a, you you have sociology training or you have psychology training or you okay. have economics training what what theories can you bring to the table uh to sort of because think about this like like a lot of gender entrepreneurship research uses like you know a uh, role congruity theory or social role theory right so yeah. there as a writer you have to say what is the new thing you contribute in terms of advancing the conversation right because those theories are already being used but let's say you have sociological training and you say i'm going to bring devaluation theory from sociology into entrepreneurship oh okay so now you've brought something new now tell us how is what you are suggesting different from the existing theories and allows us to understand something that those theories don't allow us to understand so that's sort of the the other way of bringing in a theory so 
which which means i mean i'm only realizing that i one really has to read very variedly and widely to know what is present only when i know what is present can i really use it yeah so that sunita you i'm glad you say this because you know when phd students come to me and say or mention that they have this research idea i ask them so what's the bibliography of this research idea which is what papers have you read to come up with this research idea and when i see a short bibliography or no bibliography they just came up with the research idea i say to them what you just said which is you need to know what exists before you can tell me what you will be doing to advance the conversation right right yeah thank you sir thank you thank you sunita adarsh you have a question yeah uh, thank you professor gupta for patiently answering all our questions um so my question is regarding uh, today's reading your chapter and ireland uh, paper uh, they mentioned a resource based view there uh, so uh, my question is regarding if you want to apply resource based view uh, not just apply i mean uh, to see its relevance or benefit to uh, early stage uh, startups or new ventures uh, now uh, in wernerfeld uh, wernerfeld's paper uh, he mentions about the multi product uh you know firms he he created this uh, view for uh, firms who are uh, who you who have multi products uh and then he talks about the, the benefits that can be gained from joint costs and later on he talks about how the productive and unproductive you know utilization of of the resources would benefit these firms who have multi products uh and the distribution of resources amongst these different products Now my question is for startups or or early stage ventures they mostly have single products you know which, which they are developing now if if this is the boundary condition for applying or, or using resource based view then how how do we uh, you know use this for early stage firms uh, who have one product and then uh, it may not be relevant to, to to tell them about the joint costs because they would have resource uh, scarcity or resource constraints uh, then how how do we justify them though i mean i understand that resources are important and and you know everybody would gain from effectively utilizing the resources but then how do this a boundary condition uh, you know apply if you want to use this for early stage startups specifically for the rbv i think i there's a, there's several different layers to this question which is first is does the field agree that the boundary condition you just described is a boundary condition for rbv and i would suggest no because over time rbv seems to have been used in all sorts of different situations other than the situation you described with you know multi product multinational or whatever kind of corporations where they have multiple products so i would say even if that was a boundary condition in werner felt and i i it was a long time when i read werner felt i would need to go back and read it uh to 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 make up you know to to decide whether i agree with you or not uh, on on whether it was a boundary condition but assuming it was i would say the field has sort of moved beyond that boundary condition a long time back okay because it's been applied in so many different ways and you know resource based view has sort of evolved almost like a generic you know anything related to resources you know let's use resource based view kind of thinking uh, now the question is of course you know how applicable is resource based view to new ventures which is the issue you brought up right and to me that sounds like a topic for a paper right we 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 can review the literature on the use of new venture new uh, on the use of resource based view or theory to new ventures and based on that review we can decide whether people are using it accurately inaccurately are there omissions in how they are using it are there oversights that they are not considering such as the one you described or are they considering those and they figured out a solution to those right so that to me seems like a review piece right there and if you want to do it go ahead uh, resource based view in the context of new ventures uh, the you know how has the literature used it where is the literature missing some key things where can the literature go from here remember don't just tell people 
what's wrong, also tell them where can they go from here. So that to me seems like a good, good review piece. Uh, just a quick follow-on question. So the, the benefits that are to be you know, gained from joint costs uh, would not be gained if, if they aren't more than one product. So Yes. If the resource-based view sort of rests on the joint cost, right? Then you are correct. Then how can you use resource-based view in a, in a firm that has only a single product? But ask yourself, are people not using resource-based view also for firms that have or, or, or in context where it's just a team with no product? If yes, are they moving beyond the, the assumptions of joint cost and there is something else in resource-based view that they're latching on? So that's how you sort of dig deeper into an area. Okay. Yeah. Does, that, does that help? Thank you. Are you a PhD? So I, had, I, had a follow -on, I had a follow on question, but I'll just stop here. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, Chandra, do you want to ask the last question then? Yes, Professor. Thank you. So, my question is very basic, you know, and uh, it came from, uh, originated from the interview of uh, Dr. Saras Saraswati that she used to write at least, you know, something before she goes to sleep. So, you also mentioned in the talk today that you also, you know, do research daily. So what exactly do you mean by that? I mean, you read something new or you write something both on a daily basis? You read and you write daily, both. Uh, you, you, you read the papers and you write uh, on at least one or two of your papers on an everyday basis. Now, again, you know, every day doesn't mean 24, uh, you know, 7, 365, right? All of us need to take a vacation. We have families that need time. You know, we need some recharging time, uh, you know, things like that. But on a, on, a, on a generally speaking daily basis, you read and, and you write. And as Swati just mentioned, you cannot write without reading, right? So you have to read. For example, I'm working on a paper with Gulshan on, you know, where we use social role theory and social dominance theory. Uh, and, you know, sort of on the days that I'm working on that paper, I have to read and I have to write sort of simultaneously, right? But on the days that I'm not working on that paper, then I'm working on some other paper. And for that paper, I read and I write. So, so that's, uh, that's what, what I mean, both writing and reading. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much because at this stage, we are more into reading and you know, less into writing. So I have to no. change that. No, it should be both. I tell PhD students, Okay, you are new to the literature, you're new to the literature, you're reading. But ask yourself, what can I write? Maybe what I can write is reviews, right? You can start reviewing for conferences. You read and you write. Uh, one of the things I, I asked Swati to do when she started working with me was I asked her to let's I said, let's do, let's write a book review for a journal. So we read a book. Then you write a review, then we publish that review. So because writing comes with practice, right? Last time, I think it was Ashish or someone who brought up, you know, when, when Brian said, you know, you improve as a writer, I think Ashish raised some questions about it. And my, my response is, we don't know how William Shakespeare was when he started writing. We don't know. What we see is his output when he became a successful writer. Right? right. What I see is that for most people, you improve as you write. And, you know, unless you're willing to spend the time to write, uh, of course, you need to read, but you need to also spend the time to write and get feedback and improve your writing and, and revise. And that's how you learn how to write. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, Radha, you uh, go the last question. And just, then... Yeah, just last question. Yes, sir. Just to tune with your answer right now. So can you suggest about book review kind of paper? Sure. I don't know anything about. So can you suggest or I mean share something? Yeah, talk to Swati after this. Uh, okay. There are several journals now that publish, you know, book reviews. Of okay. course, you need to read the book and then, you know, you summarize. Yeah, that is okay. That is right. right. Critically evaluate the book and, you know, 
Swati, the one that Swati did was published in International Small Business Journal, uh, which is which is a good journal. Uh, but my my point in you know doing that with her was you know she started working with me and I wanted to see if she's willing to take the time to read and willing to take the time to write because you know a lot of people say they want to work but if they are not willing to do reading and writing yes sir absolutely that, that's you know that's the basic of our profession right um, so that's that would be sort of my advice she can tell you you know the journal where we published but there's many journals organization and management journal omj does it uh, uh i asq does it but i think that's very high that's very difficult to get to uh then uh, academy of management one of the journals does it amle i think does it but those are also more difficult to get to so you so, but how to of, choose yeah how to choose book like i mean do they have some area for book review paper or well, they, so if you look at let's say international small business journal where we've published where i think three or four of my doctoral students have published book reviews uh including swati uh, go back and look at a few of their reviews right and see like okay uh you know what are they publishing and the books are entrepreneurship books like academic books and then you can reach you know you can reach out to the editor and say i want to review this book and you know is that okay with you uh, and when when i reach out to an editor like that i'm always thinking how can i make their work easier okay because as you as sunita pointed out earlier we are all busy right the editor is busy the reviewers are busy everyone's busy but i want to publish so i never ask the editor for example to get me a copy of the book and i i tell my doctoral students that too we will not ask the editor to get us a copy of the book i do not want to add to the editor's workload we will get a copy of the book ourselves and i find that editors actually appreciate that you tell them don't worry i'll get the copy of the book i got it okay then you know you send them a review and they'll give you feedback and then you improve and you submit and uh, that's how the process goes okay sir got it sir thank you sir thank you very much no problem and uh, swati can help you more on that so talk to her yes sir i will definitely i contact her sir perfect thank you guys for your patience we went down from 110 to 37 people which is expected given you know given how long we went but thank you very much and i'll see you guys uh, next weekend next wednesday thank you so thank much you, thank, thank you sir thank you very much thank you sir thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.